Hey, preschool peeps. Hi, peeps. It's December holiday time, and as you know, we do some special things during days that are uh, holidays. And I know that a lot of people are not working on December 26th, so what we decided to do was release one of our lost episodes. We hope that you enjoy it. This episode is both YouTube and podcast provider, listen and video next week when people are still potentially off on January 2nd, we are doing something very special that will be listen only. So today, if you're on YouTube, you can watch next week. We hope you go to a podcast provider or something like Amazon music, audible, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, listen to that episode. It's a great topic. And then we will be back with new original just recorded episodes after January 2nd. But please stay tuned. You haven't heard this one either. Peeps. Enjoy. Welcome to How Preschool Teachers Do It. This is Allison Kentos. I am an early childhood educator. And this is Cindy Tarabush. I am an early childhood consultant. This podcast is for parents and early childhood professionals. Let our experience and research-based knowledge become your guide. Welcome aboard, preschool peeps. (laughs) Hello, peeps. (laughs) (laughs) That was very, very welcome aboard-y sounding of you. Right? (laughs) Hello. (laughs) And I surprised her with that. I don't know. For some reason, you sounded like the ship's captain. (laughs) (laughs) There. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, howdy there. Um, so yeah. today we're going to be talking about play and learning to play because children will naturally explore things from the time they're born. That doesn't mean that they know a, high, a slightly higher level of playing. And sure. one of the impacts from the pandemic has been that children have had less time playing. There was a chunk of their young life that was not spent in the sort of settings where they would play with many different people. As we've said on other episodes, play is essential to children figuring out their world and practicing the skills that they learn. We learned this from Fred Rogers of Mr. Rogers Neighborhood is one of the people who talked a lot about this. But I'm hearing from a lot of early childhood professionals that children are simply entering settings now without any knowledge of how to play, which is different than it was before times in the, what my son calls the before times before March of 2020. (laughs) He does. He calls it the before times, the before times in the before times, even (laughs) though children might not have been in early childhood programs, they had a more of a grasp of how to play. It seems than they do now. And so many, so many teachers have said that to me, When I bring it up when I'm conducting talks or professional development and I can see the people on Zoom or wherever and I say it, I get a lot of nodding that children simply are lost and don't know what to do. Well, yeah, because I feel like even if they weren't in an early childhood setting in the before times, (laughs) they at least were playing with the kids in the neighborhood probably or the kids in their building or, you know, I mean, now I feel like the only thing they really have is to play with their siblings if they have any siblings and those siblings are not the same age as them most likely so it's different kind of play and even if their social circle is expanding by the time you listen to this episode because not everyone listens to episodes immediately right even if their social circle is better and expanding now we have to remember that a lot of their formative years the years where the foundation Mm -hmm. is set for understanding and knowing certain things were spent in a pandemic situation yeah. We've said, I've had conversations with teachers where I've said to them, remember, the children have spent uh, a third of their life in a pandemic. And then I had conversations where I said, remember, the children have spent a half of their early childhood in a pandemic. There are going to be conversations like, yeah. remember, the children have spent the majority of the time from ages birth to three when the most brain development takes place and birth to five, which is the other category of most brain yeah. development over the course of a lifetime. Well, that all was spent in a pandemic. We have to remember that the impact of this is not 
going to end when we could all say, okay, it's reached a point where we have herd immunity or it's over or whatever, whatever, I, whatever the future but, holds in store. Yeah, because I feel like the impact is already here. It's been a year and a half. It's impacted them, period. If you have a three-year-old in your in your classroom right now, they a year and a half is half of their life. They, they really have not known normal life. I mean, when life was pre-before times, they were a year old. They don't remember that, you know? So they got a good year there, you know? And then after that, it was like, it's lost. It's, you don't know what they have. I mean, it's like. They can't, they're, they're not going to know what they didn't learn then, even if it's over yeah. by the time you're listening to yes, this, they, yeah. which I think over is a very relative term. So right. what, what we have to do is help children to learn how to play. When children are infants, they are take information in primarily through their senses. They're very curious about things. They manipulate things. They take it and they want to touch it and smell it and taste it. Mouth it and yeah, right. Yeah. Put it in their mouth, hear if it makes noise. They're manipulating objects. They move, they want to grab things, throw things, move things from one place to another. And that is what Jean Piaget taught us was the sensory motor phase of development or stage of development. Once they hit about two, two and a half, they start to move on to pre-operational where we see a slightly deeper play where they are pretending, imagining. Um, and so when they start to pretend is when they enter that pre-operational stage. But they may, what you may see is that children start to naturally pretend, but they simply don't know how to use different things in your space. They don't know how to do it with other people, which is an important That's part of play. True. Yes. They, they don't understand the purpose of things and objects or the expectation of the different places in an early childhood program, the different parts of the room. They may not understand the expectation when you give them new toys for holidays because that foundation wasn't laid as well or the same, I won't even say as well it wasn't laid the, in the same way that it was in the before times. And I've had lots of teachers just look at me and say, they really simply don't know how to play this year. And I have a curriculum that I'm supposed to be doing while these children don't know how to play. Attention needs to be paid to the fact that they need to learn how to play. Right. And that there needs to be some place at which the two can happen. I am working with my curriculum and we are working to support and add to your skills and move you along the progression of learning okay. something. And at the same time, I'm filling in these gaps in your understanding of how to sit together and use objects in the same space and how these objects are used and what my expectations are for the different areas that's going to take modeling and practice. Yes, yes. There, you know, I've, I've told some teachers um, if they would spend the beginning of their school year, let's say the first couple of weeks, simply spending time in the different areas of their room and playing with the children. And then they start their routine of different other kinds of intentional experiences and all that stuff. And ordinarily we would, we would spend a couple of weeks just saying, let's look around what's in the room. Let's see how we play with this. Let me show you as we acclimate them. That acclimating them may take longer and deeper thought with children, not only who you've experienced prior to listening to this episode, but also in the future. In the future, yeah. We need to figure out how do we do both? How do we, do we teach them to play? And the way you teach them to play, folks, is real simple. You play with them. You play with them. Right. Yes. You have to model it. You have to model. show them. And you have to demonstrate the expectation. You have to demonstrate the negotiation. And, and this year, people have told me they've had to actually look at children and say, let me show you how the Legos go together. Yes. You have to show them almost everything. Stuff that like in the past, they would just know, they would come to you knowing they don't necessarily know. So it's just, 
yeah, I feel like that's what we're doing more of than anything else. Is, you know, the, the thought strikes this me. This is how you play with this. Right. This is how you play with others. You know, yeah. The thought strikes me that, you know, families have different materials at home to, to play with children than we do in early mm-hmm. childhood programs yeah. and settings. Yeah. But there's also a shortage of a lot of things and transportation issues. And we don't even know what people are able to get their hands on at home to to play with their children. This is why I think of that story. A teacher told me this story. She said she gave each child uh, Play-Doh. Yes. And she thought, oh, you know, Play-Doh is like, for those people who don't know, Play-Doh is like a fallback for early childhood settings (laughs) where if you want to keep the children busy or you want to give the children something that will really appeal to them to calm them down if they're having trouble transitioning into your space let's go use the play-doh because it's (laughs) multi-sensory and and a lot of children understand what to do with something squishy like that yeah or moldy mold not moldy moldable sorry wrong word no no moldy it shouldn't be moldy Uh, disclaimer don't like it moldy stuff moldable pliable Pliable. (laughs) thank you pliable oh my gosh this speaking so uh, I had a teacher tell me this year that for the first time ever in her career, which spanned more than 20 years, she took out Play-Doh. She brought some children were like, what's that? And she said, oh, it's the dough. We can make shapes and we can make things. And she said she opened the containers, plopped out some Play-Doh in front of them. And she said five kids literally just sat there staring at it. No one touched it. Nobody knew what to do. She said, everybody just sat there looking at it. And she, she went over and she was like, watch when I pick it up and I squish it my hands, it moves. Yeah. It takes different shape. Smell it. It smells really good. She showed them what to do with the Play-Doh toys, you know, where you can take them in cookie cutter shapes and roll the rolling pins for Play-Doh and all that stuff. And she said, for the first time in my entire career, I had a bunch of kids sitting at a table looking at it like I had just handed them a food that they had never seen before. And they weren't sure if they should do anything with it. She said, they just sat there like, um, what, what do we do here? And she said, Cindy, that was dough. Yeah. But think about that. This might be the very first normal school year that those kids typical school year that these kids have had so like last year they may have been home you know a lot of settings were still home at that point so like if you don't have play-doh at your house you're not going to know what to do don't you it's just don't you find though that like something like that like i I taught toddlers for a while they walked in the room and just picked it up and grabbed it yeah i I wonder if i know some of their just something else going on how to do things has transferred over to maybe it's not the the play-doh itself maybe it's not i'm sitting with five other people my age i don't know how to operate here what if it what if we have inadvertently taught people kids not to touch things through this oh oh that right i just thought like maybe they they know you don't touch things because there's germs on things and this could be i mean because i mean who knows what impact this pandemic is going to have i feel like we might have a bunch of germophobic people which is fine with me but like well i have heard tale. Still, i have like, heard tale of kids saying things to teachers like my i'm not allowed to hold your hand i'm yes. not allowed to hug you i'm not right. kids are saying that in the early They're childhood years. things like that so i feel like the impact of this pandemic is not just like they don't know how to play it might be a little bit like they're they might be a little scared they're afraid play. of the play they need They're to learn how to play, play is the bottom line. Yeah. Right. And they need to realize it's not something to be scared of. You could still do it in a safe way. You know, right. Yeah. And, and folks, people at home with children and people in programs, early childhood programs with children are definitely going to have to spend more intentional time teaching them yeah. how to play and the expectation. Again, I'm going to come back to the question, where do we meet that with curricular demands. And I think we meet that with curricular demands by putting it under the category of social emotional development. Yeah. And saying yeah. maybe it's not only or the same goals that we've had in the past for social past. emotional development. Yeah. And, and maybe you have a goal that says, or an objective that says, something about learning how to play or playing with a couple of classmates or playing with others or something. 
we're going to have to take that and back our expectations down and say, okay, no matter what age or, or developmental level of child I get, it may be a fact that I've got to teach this child how to play the parameters around play, how to play around other children, right. that it's okay to touch certain things that we are making yes. sure are clean and sterile. Um, I, I think that we're going to have to spend more time. And maybe if we do put it under the, because it is social emotional it development, is. if we put it yeah. under that domain, it helps us to organize it in our heads because we don't know where to put it. You know, when, when a whole world is saying to you, listen, the children need to, quote, catch up, unquote, on literacy, yeah. math, <laughs> yeah. science, right? They need, this is where you need to concentrate, but you can't do any of that if they don't know how to yeah. sit together and use things right. at the same time and play yeah. with things because so, learning has to be fun and playful in the early childhood years. Right. And I feel like this whole, like, let's catch them up kind of thing. It's like, yeah, but in order to catch them up, you have to meet them where they are right now, which right now they're at a place where they don't know how to play because they weren't able to play for a year and a half. <laughs> you know, like, not so, in the same like, way anyway, not, not, in, the same not in the same way, way because not of the in the way that we people. got when we were kids. Yeah. So like, yeah. it's like, this is, you have to meet them there in order to get them here, you know? So like, it's, in a really concrete piece of advice, yeah. right? Really concrete. Let's say you have small group time, which you should yeah. in your early childhood setting separate from free choice time. So free choice time, you're going to go out there and play with them and they'll see lots yeah. of demonstration. You might actually have to spend small group time where let's say one adult is doing a literacy-based activity. Another adult is taking a small group into the different areas of the room and playing with them and rotating that throughout the week. And maybe another small group is doing something else a little more independent or a, or if you have enough adults doing math, but you might actually have to say, okay, we're going to, this is how we're going to do small group. If you have two adults, I'll do literacy with everybody. Yeah. We'll rotate it in the morning and then we'll do math in the afternoon, or we'll do a B days where we do literacy yeah. one day, math, the other, because we've got to get these children acclimated to playing around each other and using different objects. Part of it can also be someone said to me, I wonder if they feel some self-consciousness and that could be too. That could be too. Yeah. Because they be have been so there's been such concern over what we do with ourselves that they're a little more self-conscious and we need to kind of loosen that up. Yeah. I, you know, we assume so many things. We assume children are born knowing how to behave. We assume children are born knowing how to play. And even once they learn how to play with things, let's say they've learned how to play with things in a room full of three-year-olds. Will you bring them in a room full of four and five-year-olds? The toys are going to be different. Please don't assume that they can do it ever the before times or now they don't or now. just yeah. because they've used toys in the past or they've played in the past doesn't mean that they understand what to do in your room rules and expectation expectations change from place to place. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, I hope that this has given everybody food for thought. Um, and if, you know, we tend to work in early childhood, pe professionals work in silos all we know is what's happening in our class, oh, in our yeah. program. I hope that one of the really good purposes of this podcast sometimes is to teach you new things and sometimes to give you exposure to the fact that what you're experiencing is universal. You're not alone. Yeah, it might make you feel better to know that people all over the place, all over the world, we have international listeners are all going through the same thing. And there's yes. some comfort in that. You know, it's not just you, it's not just your classroom it's across the globe, you know, and we're all, we're all in it. And we're all doing, but it's, it's nice to know that other people are kind of having the same, having the same experiences, experiences. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you want to contact us, please do so. The website is how preschool teachers do it.com. We're also have, we also have a page. I can't even say it. A page <laughs> on Facebook with the name of the podcast. Look for us, yes. send us messages. We yeah. love hearing from our listeners. Yeah. And we'll catch you next time on the podcast, folks. Bye, peeps. 